Hi, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but hopefully this tape will be just as good as if I was there in person. The first book on the list is Yo Hungry Wolf. This came out late last spring, and it uh, didn't, didn't come out soon enough to be on my spring bibliography, but uh, it's too good to pass up. This is the story of the uh, big bad wolf, and it, he's very, very hungry. It is done in rap, and there are three nursery tales in this story. First, what happens is that the big bad wolf goes and he meets the three little pigs, and this is how this sounds. This here's the tale of a wolf that was hungry, had a swollen stomach all hollow and spongy, went to the barnyard looking for eats and spied three pigs all juicy and sweet. You kind of get the way that this goes. It's really delightful. Well, uh, the, the pigs outsmart him, and he is very, very hungry. As you can see, he's very skinny, too, and so he thinks to do is check out grandma's to see what's for dinner and on the way he meets little red well little red and the woodsman completely outfox him too and so then you see him slinking out of the woods in granny's gown in granny's hat and who does he meet but the boy that cried wolf this is a great book that you can use for both uh, kindergarten all the way through high school let the kids do their own nursery tales in rap a delightful story. Next we have uh, something new from Lynn Reed Banks and this is a departure for her. She is working now with uh, younger children in this book. This is called The Magic Hair. Now you notice that this book is kind of floppy. The reason why is this is an advanced copy of a book that's coming out in hardcover. In fact the next six on the list are that way. By the time you see this tape hopefully you'll have these books in hardcover. But what we have here are 10 short stories about this magic hair. Not a rabbit, but a hair. One of them is about a uh, dragon that flies uh, through the, uh, around the earth trying to find uh, maidens that he can gobble up. And of course, the magic hair is bound to foil him. These tales are very warm and witty, very, very clever. Another one is about the black and white witch. Now, normally you think of a witch as being white with black clothes. Well, this is about a black witch with white clothes, and she's a pretty neat lady. Another one is about a king who goes through money so fast that his kingdom is always poor because he's always out of money. And he decides what he's going to do for the person that can come in with the biggest amount of money to help him out of his problem gets to marry his daughter. Now, his daughter isn't fond of this at all. And if you notice the picture of this king, it, it's, it's cute because the artist in this, the illustrator, is Barry Moser. And this picture uh, shows a king that looks very much like Barry Moser. My favorite one, though, is when the rabbit meets the vampire. And what he does, he, uh, as, as soon as this vampire is ready to get a girl, what he does, he causes the vampire's teeth to all drop out. Well, you can't be a very successful vampire without any teeth. Uh, again, very delightful stories. Last year, I don't know how many of you remember, I had a book about a boy that had muscular dystrophy and was in a wheelchair. I think it's really important for kids to have an understanding of kids with disabilities. And you can probably tell from the cover of this that this book, Eddie Lee, is about a boy with Down syndrome. And it starts out at the beginning of summer vacation, and we have our little girl here, Christy, and she's kind of bored, wondering what she's going to do with summer vacation, and she sees Eddie Lee sitting across the street. Now, her mother has said always to be kind to Eddie Lee, but he's, he's different, and she's not too sure of the whole situation. And so she goes and she meets up with her friend, Jim Bud, and they're going to go to, down to a pond to look for tadpoles, and Eddie Lee wants to come along with them. But Jim Bud says, no, you're different. I don't want you around. And he's not nice to Eddie Lee at all. So Eddie Lee turns away, and he's very, very unhappy. So the two of them, Christy and Jim, Jim Bud, go down to the pond. And while they're there, Eddie Lee follows. And he goes right into the pond, and he finds a salamander. And he picks it up very carefully and gives it to Christy. And then he said that he knows where there are tadpoles, because Jim Bud did not know where there were tadpoles. And so he and Christy go to a pond, and they find tadpoles. And uh, Christy wants to take the tadpoles home. But uh, um, Eddie Lee says, no, they can't do that, because otherwise the mother frog would be very, very sad. And then they look into the pond, and they's, there's ripples in the pond, because the frog has just jumped in. 
And Eddie Lee says, you look funny, Christy. And then he says that that's okay. He says, I like you anyway. He grinned his wide grin and put his right hand over his heart. It's what's here that counts, he says. And so Christy gains a great understanding uh, for Eddie Lee, and he's really a neat kid. I'm always looking for a good Halloween book. The one that I chose this year is By the Light of the Halloween Moon. And again, this is floppy because it, the hardcover isn't out yet, so bear with me. And this is about a toe, a lean and gleaming toe that taps a tune in the dead of the night by the light, by the light, by the silvery light of the Halloween moon. Well, on the next page you see a cat that is after the toe. And then you see a, a witch that is after the cat that is after the toe. And then a bat that's after the witch that's after the cat that's after the toe. And it keeps on going on like this. You go through a ghoul, a ghastly, drooling, graveyard ghoul. And then you have a ghost, a Willowa ghost. And then you have a sprite, a grumpy, grungy, hobgoblin sprite. And then it's a girl that is on the other end of that toe, a small, bright slip of a smiling girl who smacks the sprite, who bites the ghost, who trips the ghoul, who swats at the bat, who bumps the witch as she snatches the cat when he springs through the air to catch the toe that taps a tune in the dead of the night. Oh, no, you don't, she says. That toe is mine. By the light, by the light, by the silvery light of a Halloween moon. Oh, kids could have a ball with this one. You hear a lot in education today about cross crossing curriculums, and this book is, is great for that. My Christmas Safari is really the 12 days of Christmas set in Africa. So on the first day of Christmas, my father showed to me a green truck for our safari. And then the last verse goes, on the 12th day of Christmas, my father showed to me 12 elephants trumping, 11 lions roaring, Ten topas trotting, nine hyenas howling, eight hippos yawning, seven flamingos flying, six zebras barking, five big baboons. I'd sing this for you, but I know you really wouldn't want me to. Four shy giraffes, three wildebeest, two leopard cubs, and a green truck for our safari. You know, wouldn't it be fun to do this with other countries? You could do this with other country, countries. You could do it with so many things. Uh, a great book. And you know that I'm always looking for a very, very special Christmas book and something that's really warm that leaves a lump in your throat when you're done with the book. In fact, it's so lumpy that you can hardly get through it. And uh, for the past couple years, I haven't found anything. Of course, my favorites have always been Polar Express and Year of the Perfect Christmas Tree. But this year, I think I've got it. Santa Calls by William Joyce. This is about a boy named Art Atchison Amesworth, and he lives in Texas. And he's an orphan. He lives around the turn of the century. He lives with his uncle and aunt who have a Wild West show. And um, he has a good friend named Spaulding and a younger sister named Esther. Now, his only bad trait is that sometimes he's very mean to Esther. One time, a box, just before Christmas, a box showed up in his yard with an S on the side of the box and inside the box they found a note that said assemble the contact contents come north yours SC well they they um, assembled this great flying machine and they took off to the North Pole but before they got there they were met with the dark queen and her dark elves who tried to capture them and they were able to uh, get rid of them by hurling snowballs at them and one of the snowballs that was thrown by little Esther hit the queen squarely, and she said, I'll get you for that, so remember that. Now, Esther almost didn't get to go on this excursion because Art didn't want her to go, but he finally relented and let, it, and let her go. So they get to the North Pole, and of course, everything is exciting. It's the night before Christmas, and Santa is getting ready to leave, and look at the illustrations. It's just beautifully illustrated. And Art said, ask Santa Claus, oh, wh why did you ask us to come? And Santa says, some secrets are best left unsolved. 
So they get in the sleigh and they're ready to take off on their big uh, Christmas Eve adventure when who appears but the dark witch in her dark elves and they capture little Esther. And Santa says, we'll have to call out the guard. But Ard had this funny twinge inside of him and he says, no, I'll go rescue my sister. So he does that and he has to use his imagination and his wit, but he does get Esther back from the Dark Queen. So the next scene that you see is them back in Texas and Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus are putting him in bed and they go on their way doing their night before Christmas thing. The next morning they get up and Art has gotten a brand new puppy, one of those that was running around at the North Pole and he's so excited about his new dog. Spalding gets a brand new canoe and he's excited, but Esther only has two letters. And the boys say, oh, Esther, how sad. There's nothing to play with. And she smiles very secretively, and she puts the envelopes into her little jacket, and, and they go off and play. Well, what's in those envelopes? This is the thing that leaves the lump. The first letter is from Esther to Santa Claus, and it says, Dear Santa, you can send me toys if you like, but what, what I really wish for is for my brother Art to be my friend. Yours, Esther Ainsworth. And the other letter is from Santa Claus, and it says, Dear Esther, such a rare and wonderful request could not be refused. I'm glad our little adventure did the trick. Signed, S.C. Isn't that neat? I just love this book. Okay, as you know, I'm always looking for a poetry book, too. And it was hard this year. I picked out uh, Jack Prolutsky's Dragons Are Singing Tonight with the Peter, or pictures by Peter Sis. And it was an, in a strong contest with a book that you'll see on the also worth mentioning list that's called Walker, which is uh, a collection of Native American poetry. And the uh, artwork is just absolutely beautiful. But that is for uh, grades fifth uh, on up. And so I chose this one. As you can tell, it's all about dragons, and I'll read you just a couple so that uh, you kind of get the idea of what this is like. Dragon brag. Once upon a happenstance, I met a knight in armor. I fixed my flame upon his lance. It was a for alarmer. Another one very quickly. I have a secret dragon is the title. My dragon's very gentle. My dragon's very kind. No matter how I pull its tail, my dragon doesn't mind. We splash around together and play at silly things. Then when I'm finished bathing, it tries me with its wings. Very fun. Kids would really enjoy it. Okay, next one on the list is Hannah. This is for uh, um, somebody in grades like uh, second and third that's beginning to read. Hannah is a story that takes place in northern Michigan in about the late uh, 1880s. And this little girl is blind, and she is kept home on the farm because mom and dad just don't think that she could function in a classroom. Well, in those days, teachers often lived with families. And they, uh, there was a new teacher that came to town, and she asked that Anna be sent to school. Well, this was a new concept, and Anna, or Hannah was very excited about this, but her mother and dad weren't, particularly her mother. Her mother wanted to keep her at home, but she finally relented and let Hannah go to school. And it's the whole story of Anna, Hannah coming out in this story. It's a beautiful story. If you do anything with Helen Keller, it would be a good uh, compliment to that study. Itchy Richard, again done on a very low level. This is about a boy named Richard who is in a class that has had problems with lice. And right now they're having a problem like that. And uh, Richard was, did a pasting project. And you know that white paste kind of flakes off and he put his head, hand on his head and some of that paste flaked off so the kids accused him of having lice. Well, of course he didn't have lice and how is he going to prove this and who really did have it in class that was causing other kids to have it. A funny book and yet you learn a lot about lice. I, I learned a lot about lice. I had always thought it was kind of a dirty person's disease, but that's our problem. But that's not the case. So it is a fun read. Love You Soldier. Again, we go back to Sirius. And again, done on about a third uh, grade reading level. This takes place during World War II and it's about a little girl named Katie who lives in New York. She's Jewish. She is an only child and dad goes off to war. 
mother takes in her best friend, or her own best friend, not Katie's best friend, and her best friend is pregnant. And one time when mom is at work, this lady goes into labor, and Katie has to help her get to the hospital. Um, then dad dies, and needless to say, it, it's a very trying situation. Now mom's best friend's brother comes courting, and Katie can't handle this too well. But finally, in the end, everything works out. And so it's a story of changes. It's a very warm, touching story and one that I think should be told. Leaves in October is going to be in paperback. Uh, unfortunately, at this taping, I don't have the paperback. But this is a very special uh, story. It's a modern day story. It's about a man and his two children. The man has lost his, his job. And mother has disappeared. She can't handle the fact that there is no money and no security at all. So she has disappeared. And the little girl in the story, Livy, uh, feels responsible. Mother never explains why she disappears until the end of the book. They end up in a homeless shelter. Dad has promised them before the leaves turn in October, he will have a home for them. But as he searches and searches for a job that will support his family, it looks like that's not going to happen. And so what, what happens in this book? How does it end? Of course, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to read it and find out. Brown Bird Singing is a story of Anego. This is a little uh, Chippewa girl whose mother died when she was very, very young. And father did not have a good job either. So he leaves Anego with this white family. And they raise her as their own. They're very, very good to her. And they keep on telling her that someday her father will return and that she will go back and live with her people. Well, she's not sure this is what she wants to do. She kind of feels like she's definitely torn between a white man's world and her Native American world. Finally, at the end of the story, Dad has gotten his degree at the university and has a teaching physician on a reservation, and she knows he's coming to get her. What is she going to do? How is she going to handle this situation? It's a beautiful book. Okay, Linda Crew, as you know, is one of my favorite authors, and when she came out with Nakoma Creek, um, I was delighted because it's very funny. It's a great book, a great read aloud, particularly for fourth graders. It's about a boy named Robbie who is in fourth grade. He lives uh, uh, in Oregon, and his family is very unconventional. Mother works, dad stays home to take care of the two two year old twins. And Robbie is, is different in that he doesn't like to play sports. He's not good at sports. So he, when it's recess time, takes a book outside and he just sits and reads. Now his fourth grade teacher doesn't think that this is right. He, she thinks that Robbie should be out playing with the boys. So she sends Robbie to a counselor. And Robbie gets all bent out of shape about this. He's so afraid that if the counselor finds out that his dad is at home and doesn't have a job, that this is not a conventional family, and that he is going to be taken away from home. Well, it really comes to a head when the counselor wins a dinner at his house and she shows up a week early. The house is in complete disarray and he's sure this is it. He's going to be taken away from his family. But the counselor assures him that that's not the case. Now she comes the next week for this dinner and the house is looking really good, but I can identify with this. Robbie says if they open a closet, they're dead meat because everything will fall out of the closet. But anyway, anyway, it's a great book and it ends very well. Uh, Onion Tears is about a little Vietnamese refugee uh, named Nam. And she is in Australia when this book takes place. And she's living with a very, very kind lady who has also taken in another Vietnamese refugee. And uh, together they work in this restaurant. Now, little Nam does not talk and she stays away from the other kids at school. And, and she's, she's a very sad little girl. But she can't cry. She's, she's just filled with memories of all of these things that have happened to her in Vietnam. And she gets these memories out. You find out what has happened to her because she writes letters to her little canary that she had to leave behind in Vietnam. And the only time she does cry is when she's peeling onions for Auntie in her restaurant. She has a very loving, warm teacher that becomes very ill. And so Nam goes over and helps her. And finally, at one point at the end of the story, she does break into tears. And she lets her emotions out. And then she, uh, then she, start talk she starts talking. But this is a good example to kids 
on what those kids in Vietnam went through. Her husband or her uh, father was taken away and never seen again. She, her mother sent her to uh, a boat to go to freedom with her grandfather. And on the way, her grandfather kept on giving her his rice, saying that he wasn't hungry. Well, when they got aboard the boat, her grandfather died. He was completely malnourished and uh, because he had given this to little Nam. So it's a, uh, it's a very, very intriguing story. If you're doing the, um, the Young Reader's Choice Awards and you are working with Clay Marble, this would be another good book to uh, show the kids along with Clay Marble. Little Gem by Gloria uh, Houston is a neat story. It takes place during the turn of the century in Appalachia, and Little Jim lives on a farm. His father, Big Jim, obviously, uh, never had much schooling, and so he's not that keen on Little Jim going to school, but Little Jim really enjoys school. He, he's a very good writer, and he's good in school. What Father wants him to do is stay on the farm and learn how to do all the things that a farmer should. Now, Dad never d had much schooling. There is one magazine that he reads. He reads a farmer's journal. And there is an essay contest at school that Jim, little Jim wants to enter, hoping that he'll win it and his father will at last be proud of him. So he does enter it, and I'm not going to tell you what happened. But anyway, Gloria Houston is the author of The Year of the Perfect Christmas Tree, which I alluded to before as one of my favorite books. Lost in Devil's Desert is a great survival story. It's about a boy named Kevin whose father is in the armed forces and father has just gone through extensive desert survival training because he's going on an assignment in the Middle East. And he shares these, um, these experiences with Kevin and it's a good thing because Kevin and his family go up to Utah to visit grandma and grandma sends him on, the, on an errand to visit this junk dealer. And as Kevin approaches, he sees that this junk dealer is being robbed and he is frightened and he jumps on the back of a pickup. Well, unbeknownst to him, the pickup belongs to the two guys that are doing the beating and they take off into the desert and when they spot Kevin, they stop and he jumps out of the truck and takes off. Well, unfortunately, what happens is that Kevin gets hopelessly lost and he uses then the skills that his father has taught him to su survive until he is found by a sheep herder. A great survival story. Last year, uh, a chapter one teacher asked me for a good book for uh, uh, fifth graders that are reading about on a third grade level, a good mystery. And at that time, I didn't have, well, I had some ideas, but none of them just uh, really fit the bill. And this summer, I read Coffin on a Case by Eve Bunting. Up. This is it. This is it. So I called her this fall, and she says, well, I'm now teaching third grade. So it didn't, didn't work out. But anyway. This would be a great book for a kid that is in like in fifth or sixth grade but reading way below le level. Henry Coffin's father is a detective and Henry himself would like to be a detective someday. Well, one day when his father is out on a case, this girl who's about three years older comes in and boy, Henry's smitten. He thinks she's pretty cool. And so um, uh, she has a real problem. Her mother is missing. And uh, she needs a detective to help her find her, her mother. And Henry's a little reluctant, but he doesn't want to lose this relationship with this girl. And the girl says that she's sure that if Henry's father is a detective, that Henry can do a job just as good as with the father. So they work together on, on the clues that are left behind. And sure enough, uh, somebody has taken this mother, and Henry ends up uh, being taken along uh, by the same people with the mother and how they get out of the situation. It's a great mystery. Really moves along well, uh, like all of Eve Bunting's things do. Okay, I'm really excited about this book. And again, by the time uh, the conference is on, we should have this in hardcover. Wolf uh, at the Door is by Missoula's own Barbara Corcoran. And what's neat about this book is that it starts out in Missoula and then most of it takes place up in Big Fork. And Barbara does admit that she takes some, of the, some liberties with this. But one thing she says when she starts out this book that I thought was really neat is that they go to um, the ice cream store Goldsmiths in Missoula and then they stop at the library where the nice librarians at the Missoula Library have saved books for her. Well, then they move up to Big Fork and because uh, father has gotten a job in a TV station. 
They stop at one of those roadside zoos that really leave a lot to be desired, and they see this wolf, this female wolf, that looks like she is just about on her last legs, and Mother is really taken with this, and so is Lee. Lee is, is very, very um, sensitive about animals. So what Mother decides to do is to buy the wolf from the creep that has this zoo. And so she buys this wolf, a female wolf named Ruthie. And they start, um, start trying to get Ruthie to come back and, uh, and, and be alive and, and uh, have some life to her. And there is a fellow that lives in Columbia Falls that have four wolves. And he hears about Ruthie and Lee and her mother and what they're doing. And, so she, uh, and he has to go on a trip. So he wants them to take care of the wolves. Well, of course, these four wolves aren't going to, uh, aren't going to uh, have anything to do with Ruthie. And Barbara has done a great job in researching wolf behavior. So you learn a lot about wolves. And unfortunately, there are people that don't want wolves to be reintroduced. So you have a real conflict here, plus the fun of reading about an area that is close to home. Monkey Island is the next one on the list. This is an ALA uh, recommended book. Again, you have the story about a boy whose family, uh, the father loses his job, mother loses the job, and they are homeless. And, and what happens is that both father and mother take off, leaving this boy on his own. And he meets up with two elderly men, one black, one white, that are living in a park where a lot of homeless people live. And what is so sad is that there's a bunch of teenagers that come to this park one night and they go through and completely wreck the few things that these homeless people have. Again, this is a real eye-opener to kids who do not have any understanding or knowledge about what these people go through. Well, isn't this a lovely book? I don't even have a hardcover of this book that will be out in paperback real soon. The Gift of the Girl Who Couldn't Hear. We have a girl named Eliza who is 13 years old. This would be a great book for uh, reluctant readers also. And uh, Eliza had everything going for her. She had a very good friend who is deaf. And all of a sudden, when Eliza hit 13, she, there was nothing she really wanted to do. And how Eliza, or how her deaf friend pulls her out of this slump. It's a beautiful book, a beautiful book, and one I highly recommend. Steal Away is another neat story about a girl who, it takes place before the Civil War. This girl lives in the North. She's heard about slavery and has a, knows that it is wrong. Well, unfortunately, she's an only child, and her parents uh, die accidentally. And she is sent to the South to live with an uncle and aunt and her two cousins. Her older cousin is a male who um, has a few problems. She meets up, this girl's name is uh, Savannah, and she meets up with a servant girl, a black girl, named Bethlehem. Now, the older uh, cousin hits on Bethlehem, and Bethlehem wants to leave. But she knows if she leaves and she's caught, she's probably going to be killed. But they decide that they will uh, leave. And so, because uh, Savannah isn't happy at this house at all uh, either, um, she's, she's just completely ignored. And so the two of them do steal away in the middle of the night. They dress up as, as uh, boys. And on their way, they see signs uh, advertising that they are runaway slaves and that they are to be returned. And at one point, Susanna is cut accidentally, and she is really in bad shape. And Bethlehem knows that she's got to get help for uh, Susanna, otherwise Susanna is going to die. And so she risks her life going up to this farmer to ask for help. Well, fortunately, the farmer is a Quaker and puts him on the uh, Underground Railroad as soon as uh, Susanna gets uh, better. But it's a wonderful story of the coming together of this black girl and this white girl. Lizzie Borden. OK, this is a new series that's coming out by Harper uh, Rowe. Be Judge, Be the Jury, and these are true trials. And Lizzie Borden has always fascinated me. You know, uh, Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax, and when she was done, she gave her father 41. Well, this is all about the trial. So kids learn about trials, juries, the prosecutors, and the lawyers, and what they do. And so you get a blow-by-blow -blow description with pictures of, um, of everything that happened in this trial. And did she do it, or did she not? At one point, I said, of course she did it. You know, how could she be around and not hear somebody or her mother or her father screaming for help as they got whacked 
uh, by this ex. There's all kinds of evidence pointing up to the fact that she did it. But if she did it, why didn't people find blood on her, anywhere on her, in her hair or anything? She didn't have time to change or wash before people saw her. So what is the story? You have to be the jury and figure it out. It's a lot of fun. Next one, So Young to Die, the true story of Hannah Senich. This is about a girl, uh, Hannah, who was born in Hungary, like in the 1920s. She had a wonderful life. She was Jewish, and then all of a sudden, the clouds of World War II and Nazism started coming. And she, being Jewish, thought that she would, she'd like to avoid all this and go to Palestine. And she tried to talk her mother, mother into going to Palestine with her. Well, of course, the Jewish movement was very young at that time, and she just, she really enjoyed what she was doing. Well, World War II came around, and about 1944, it looked terrible for the Jews that were still in Hungary, and she felt guilty that she wasn't there bearing the burden. So the British wanted to form a secret troop of people that would parachute back into Hungary to rescue downed British pilots and other Jews that uh, they tried to, they wanted to get out. And of course, Hannah went back to get her mother. Well, she was caught. And at her trial, of course, she was accused of treason, and they were waiting for her to be sentenced when the end of the war came. And it looked like she would eventually be let out of jail, although her time in jail was absolutely terrible because the Nazis at that time did not take care of their prisoners very well at all. Well, one day, as she was waiting to be sentenced, a German uh, colonel, I think it was, came in and said, you're sentenced to death. And this wasn't supposed to happen. She says, I'll appeal. And he says, there's no time for appeal. You're going to die in an hour. And that's what happened to Hannah. And uh, so a very moving story of, of a very heroic girl. OK, I, I always have to have something on fantasy and folklore. And this one, A Stranger Came Ashore, is the one that I picked for this year. It takes place about, oh, maybe about 200 years ago in the islands of Scotland. And this is about a boy named Robbie. And the folklore in this is that a sea lion, the king of the sea lions, came ashore to find a girl that he could lure back into uh, the water to live with him. And the, a girl happened to be the boy in the story, Robbie's older sister. And Robbie finds out about this. He discovers this uh, stranger's secret. And in order to be able to foil this, he has to get the help of a wizard that lives in the um, in the village that he doesn't really want to have anything to do with it. Cages is on the Young Reader's Choice list this year, and I think it's excellent. These kids only have to read two or three books. This is one that I would like to see you push. This is a wonderful story about a girl named Kit who um, tries out for a part in a play and doesn't get it. And the girl that does get it has everything going for her, and Kit does not have a lot going for her. For her. She's a nice girl, but she has a stepfather who is an alcoholic. She gets home after hearing about the results of this uh, play, and her father, her stepfather, is in a drunken stupor. So she leaves, and she goes to a uh, to the mall, and there's the girl that got the part. The girl's mother is buying her a beautiful bracelet, and Kit really feels sorry for herself, so she takes a bracelet. She shoplifts, and she is caught. And one of the things that she has to do to make restitution for this is to go to the Humane Society, like once a week, and just play with the animals that are there. And she knows so that hopefully their spirits will be kept up so that they will be adopted. And she knows that these dogs are going to be put to sleep if they are not adopted. And she, she falls in love with one dog, and of course her dad won't let her have it. And so she finds somebody to adopt this dog. And she's, she goes back to the Humane Society with the money to take care of this dog, and she finds out that the dog has been put to sleep. This one is a real tearjerker, but it's so important for three things, three reasons. First thing, how to deal with an alcoholic parent. One, shoplifting. If you read this book, I can't imagine a kid trying to shoplift. And then the problem that humane societies have with unwanted animals. Just a must. Of course, another book on our Young Reader's Choice list is the first book that uh, Ben Michelson did. This is his second one, Sparrowhawk Red. And it takes place just uh, on the southern part of Arizona. It's a story about Ricky Diaz, whose mother uh, died accidentally, supposedly, in a car accident. But Ricky's father works for the feds on drug control. And they think that uh, mother's death is related to this um, 
the, the father's work. Well, Ricky decides what he's going to do is avenge his mother's death by going into Mexico and stealing a plane and bringing it back that belonged to the drug dealers and bringing it back across the border. Now, he has to know how to fly, and Dad has taught him how to fly, and this book really grabs you. Right at the very beginning, Ricky is soloing, and his father's down on the ground helping him, but things aren't going well, and it looks like Ricky's going to crash. So by page two, your heart is in your throat, and you think this kid's going to bite it, but you know he doesn't, because otherwise the story would end. Very exciting book, one that I'd highly recommend. Weirdo, winner of the Edgar Award and all kinds of awards by um, Theodore Taylor is absolutely excellent. There's a boy named Chick, Chip Cluett that lives in the South in a swamp with his father. Now, Chip is known as the weirdo because what happened to him, he was in an airplane crash and the whole left side of his body melted. So he looks just absolutely terrible. And then there's a girl that lives outside the swamp named Samantha Sanders. And she accidentally goes into the swamp and she sees something. She sees, she's sure she sees a man being carried and dumped into a pit that nobody ever comes out of. In the meantime, uh, Chip has been working with a, um, a university professor that is doing a study on bears in the swamp area because it is now illegal to hunt bears in this area. And what the professor is trying to find out is if there are enough bears for hunting to be allowed again. Now, Samantha's father wants to start hunting. Uh, Chip doesn't want anything to, uh, to do with hunting, and he hopes that hunting will be denied. So you see a real collision course coming here. Who uh, was who is responsible for this professor's death? I'm getting away here. It's an excellent book. And again, one even though it's long, I would really recommend it for reluctant readers. Nothing But the Truth is now in paperback, a runner-up for a Newberry. This is great. Philip Malloy is, this reminds me so much about junior high kids because you've got these, these boys that always try to pull something. And in Philip's junior high, at the beginning of the day, what you are supposed to do is stand at attention and be quiet while the Star Spangled Banner is played over the intercom. Well, old Philip decides to be smart, and he hums along with the Star Spangled Banner. He's supposed to be quiet. The teacher asks him to be quiet, and he, he isn't. He doesn't. He keeps on humming. So she sends him to the principal's office, and the whole thing just gets really blown up. And what this is done, this is done in documentary form. So like at uh, 710, discussion between Philip Malloy and his parents. 9.45, letter written by Margaret Narwin, who is the teacher that has sent him out of the room, to her sister. And it really is a good book, a, a good book on miscommunication. And um, what happens to Philip in the end is really That's interesting. Yes, yes, and this is on the Young Reader's Choice for the Senior Division, and a real good one. Another fun one for reluctant readers, Jerry Spinelli's There's a Girl in My Hammerlock. This is a girl named Maisie who is really very, very fond of this boy named Eric. And Eric won't have anything to do with her. He really likes this girl, this cheerleader type of girl. So Maisie decides to join the wrestling team and what she has to do to, uh, to uh, be put on the team and be able to stay on the team. It's really funny. And I think uh, kids in junior high need funny books. But the thing I like about Maisie is that she sticks to her gun. She's an individual. She doesn't go along with the crowd. And what's neat is that finally at the end, Eric does ask her out. And what happens when Maisie finally gets to date this really neat guy? You find out he's not neat at all. He's a creep. Okay, Checking on the Moon, another ALA recommended book. This is about a girl named Cab Jones, who grows up in a town similar to Missoula in Texas, where there isn't a lot of crime. And her mother has to uh, go out of town, and so she doesn't want to leave her daughter uh, in, at home. She takes, takes her to a suburb of Pittsburgh and uh, to live with Grandma. Now, Grandma runs a restaurant called Eats, and it it's, turns out to be in a very crime-ridden area. And uh, Cab helps her grandmother with the restaurant. And while she does this, she meets a, another girl that becomes her good friend. Her good friend's name is Tracy. Well, a lot of crime is taking place in this area. And Cab and Tracy and some of the other good neighbors decide to join together to fight this crime rape, uh, wave. And it's really interesting to see what they do 
to take back the streets. A, a, a good novel, I think one that will make our kids here in Montana appreciate the fact that they don't have a lot of crime in this state. Please Remove Your Elbow From My Ear by Martin Godfrey. I really like this guy. He taught junior high for a number of years, and boy, is he in tune to junior high kids. In fact, as I was reading this, I, 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 it brought back to me a lot of the frustrations I felt when I was in junior high. This is about a, a boy named Stormy who has a, a mouth that is too big. He says things when he's not supposed to say things. He's small, so he gets picked on. This is a story of dealing with bullies. Well, Stormy ends up in the detention uh, room along with some other what they call dregs of the school. And they find out that there is going to be a field hockey competition. And of course, all the suave, neat kids are on one team. And these kids in this dis detention room decide that they're going to have a team of their own. And how they outwit this smart, cocky team that, you know, the cheerleader, the, the boys that have everything type of group, it's neat. And it is funny, too. So again, you have humor. Uh, 20 Pageants Later by Caroline Cooney. I really like uh, Caroline Cooney. I think she does great stuff. Anyway, Scotty Ann is the younger sister of a girl who enters is in these beauty contests and for the most part wins. And so you know that all the attention in the family goes on this older sister. Scotty Ann finds herself involved in a beauty contest. She's, she's put there kind of by hook and by crook and she does not want to buy it or be in it. But anyway, she's in a beauty contest in her own school. And um, what happens when she is a part of this, too? A, a great story on, on being happy with yourself and not wishing you're some, somebody else. Jumping uh, the Nail is, again, by Eve Bunting. I usually don't try to have the same author with two books on my bibliography, but a good one for, again, reluctant readers that moves very, very fast. You have a girl named Drew, who the story is about. This takes place in a part of California where, as you can tell by the cover, there are these big cliffs. And it really is uh, an act of daring to jump off this 90-foot uh, cliff into the water. And it hasn't been done for 10 years. 10 years ago, a girl tried this, and she was paralyzed. She survived, uh, but she was paralyzed for the rest of her life. Well, there's a guy in, in their school named Scooter, who is a very daredevil type Type, uh, type of person, and he has a girlfriend who has a lot of emotional pr uh, problems, and he talks her into making this plunge with her. And then after they do it successfully, the girl has, has a terrible time with this. And, um, but Scooter wants to do it again. And you see that we have a real, a real problem with this. Drew tries to talk this girl out of it, and she has a boyfriend named Mike. If there's any flaw in this book, it's that Mike is a too perfect type of person. I can't believe that there's guys out there that are as neat as what Mike is. We don't want my 17-year-old son to hear me say that. Anyway, another uh, book that we hopefully will have by the time of this pr uh, presentation, Hugh Glass, Mountain Man is your ultimate survival book. This takes place in the Yellowstone area, probably about the 1830s. Hugh Glass was a mountain man, and he was attacked by a grizzly bear, almost torn in two. And he was on, a, on an expedition, and he was uh, left with two other mountain men who were just there waiting for him to die so that they could bury him properly. Well, uh, unfortunately, they saw my, uh, um, Indian sign, and they were sure that there were Indians that were going to attack and do all three of them in. So they left. One of the men that was there was Jim Bridger. Well, Hugh Glass didn't die. He crawled 200 miles to the nearest fort, mainly for revenge. But how he survived on this trek to this fort is incredible. What he had to eat would kill you just to read about it. But anyway, he, fortunately for him, some Indians did find, friendly Indians did find him and helped him along. But how his feelings of revenge uh, were softened during this trip um, really is an excellent story and a great way, if you're going to do Montana history, a great way to introduce the, um, the Mountain Man segment. As you know, I always save the best for last, and to me, this is the best. Bear Dance is a sequel to Bear Stone, Will Hobbs' uh, Bear Stone. Um, if you remember in Bear Stone, Cloyd was a Ute Indian boy that uh, was an orphan, and he was adopted by an old, or not adopted, but taken in by an old rancher in Colorado. 
and Cloyd spent a lot of time out in the wilderness and he felt that he was responsible for the shooting death of the last grizzly in Colorado. Okay, this book takes place, Cloyd has heard rumors that there was a grizzly sighting up in the mountains of Colorado. So he talks the old rancher into going up with him. When they are up there, they meet a girl. She is uh, an Indian girl from Alaska, a woman from Alaska, who works at the University of Montana in the department that researches bear. So she has heard the same rumor, and she's down there looking for uh, this grizzly also. Well, they do find the grizzly. It's a female grizzly that has two uh, cubs. And as Cloyd is watching this grizzly one day, an avalanche wipes out this mother grizzly. And he knows that the only way those two cubs are going to survive, if he stays the fall and helps them get the food that they need to survive into the winter. So it's his story of doing everything imaginable, even when they get stuck down in a cave and can't get out, and he has to go into the cave and rescue them to make sure that these cubs survive. It's a wonderful story and so very, very well written that my feeling is this is what I would like to see get the 1994 Newbery Award, uh, Award. This is what should get it. Whether it does or not will remain to be seen. Have you ever seen a Newbery awarded to a Western book? I haven't, but uh, this is what I recommend. So this is it for this year. I hope you've gotten a lot of ideas. Thank you. I made it. Okay.